Confidential. A situation report on our acquisition of advanced technology and interaction with alien cultures. January 1988. By O.H. Krill. Abstract. Throughout the 40-year period when UFO have been actively observed in our civilization, a lot of data has been gathered, data which has often pointed to aspects of the phenomena that have been suppressed. As a result of the suppression and compartmentalization of the information, our culture has been fragmented into several levels of reality, which both coexist and oppose each other. Part of our culture does not, or will not believe in the existence of other species, part of our culture acknowledges their existence or the probability of their existence, part of our culture is actually interacting with the other species. These simultaneous realities contribute to the condition of extreme confusion in which we find ourselves. Research into UFOs follows a similar pattern. Some view the matter in a completely empirical perspective, others search for patterns and functional relationships in events, still others go out and ask the right questions at the right time and get answers. Some of those answers that have appeared are, to some people, quite disturbing and fantastic. All in all, we are dealing with new concepts in physics, new concepts in psychology, and the gradually growing awareness that we are not only not alone here, but, we have never been alone here. As if that were not enough, it turns out that factions of our society have known this, and apparently have been interacting with some of these alien species for quite a while. The bottom line is that all along, humanity has been led down a false path, a path that has been plagued by layer upon layer of conspiracies and disinformation. Technological knowledge and absolute power have been the motives on the human side. Survival has been the motive on the alien side, or, at least as far as the predominant alien visitors are concerned. The intent of this paper is to bring much of the details regarding this into the open. You are not being asked to believe it, but, to consider it in the light of what has happened, what is happening, and what may be developing right under our very noses. If you find that you cannot stomach such thoughts, or that you cannot deal with it, read no further. It is quite evident, or it should be, that the UFO situation is both complex and dangerous. The UFO problem is a multi-situational and multi-dimensional phenomena. We have established the following as having a basis in fact. Craft from other worlds have crashed on Earth. Alien craft are from both ultra-dimensional sources and sources within this dimension. Early U.S. government efforts at acquiring alien technology were successful. The U.S. government has had live alien hostages at some point in time. The government has conducted autopsies on alien cadavers. U.S. intelligence agencies, security agencies, and public agencies are involved in the cover-up of facts pertaining to the situation. People have been and are currently abducted, mutilated, murdered and kidnapped as a result of the UFO situation. There is a current active alien presence on this planet among us that controls different elements of our society. Alien forces maintain bases on Earth and on the Moon. The U.S. government has had a working relationship with alien forces for some time, with the express purpose of gaining technology and gravitational propulsion, beam weaponry and mind control. Millions of cattle have been killed in the process of acquiring biological materials. Both aliens and the U.S. government are responsible for mutilations, but for different reasons. We live in a multidimensional world that is overlapped and visited by entities from other dimensions. Many of these entities are hostile. Many are not hostile. The basis of our genetic development and religions lies in intervention by non-terrestrial and terrestrial forces. Actual technology far exceeds that perceived by the public. The United States space program is a cover operation that exists for public relations purposes. People are being actively killed in order to suppress the facts about the situation. The CIA and the NSA are involved so deeply that exposure would cause collapse of their overt structure. Facts indicate alien overt presence within 5 to 10 years. Our civilization is one of many that have existed in the last billion years. You will probably have more conclusions. To see, just read on. Animal Mutilations and UFOs General Chronology In the middle of 1963, a series of livestock attacks occurred in Haskell County, Texas. In a typical case, an Angus bull was found with its throat slashed and a saucer-sized wound in its stomach. The citizenry attributed the attacks to a wild beast of some sort, a vanishing varmint. 
as it continued its furtive forays through the Haskell County outback, the blood luster assumed somewhat more mythic proportions and a new name was destined to endure, the Haskell Rascal. Throughout the following decade, there would be sporadic reports of similar attacks on livestock. These attacks were occasionally described as mutilations. The most prominent of these infrequent reports was the mutilation death of Snippy, a horse in southern Colorado in 1967, accompanied by area UFO sightings, a Condon Committee investigation and worldwide press coverage. It was in 1973 that the modern animal mutilation wave can be said to have begun in earnest. That year is generally thought of as the year of the last concerted UFO flap, although, there may be reason to question that contention, given the events of two years later. In 1973 and 1974 the majority of the classic mutilation reports originated in the central United States. In 1975, an unprecedented onslaught spread across the western two-thirds of the United States. Mutilation reports peaked in that year, accompanied by accounts of UFOs and unidentified helicopters. In 1978, the attacks increased. By 1979, numerous livestock mutilations were occurring in Canada, primarily in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Attacks in the United States leveled off. In 1980, there was an increase in activity in the United States. Mutilations have been reported less frequently since that year, though this may be due in part to an increased reluctance to report mutilations on the part of ranchers and farmers. The mutilations still continue. Over 10,000 animals have died in the United States, although, the mutilations have been occurring worldwide, the same circumstances are always present. General Observations Any investigation which intends to probe the systematic occurrence of the mutilation attacks upon livestock and other animals must include within its purview certain factors which may or may not be directly related to the acts of mutilation themselves. These mutilations, the killing and furtive removal of external or internal parts, have been directed at literally thousands of animals, primarily livestock, since the 1960s. The surgery on these animals is primarily conducted with uncanny precision, suggesting the use of highly sophisticated implements and techniques. The numbing and persistent regularity of the mutilations and the seemingly casual disposal of the useless carcasses all hint at extreme confidence, even arrogance, of the mutilators, it is an arrogance which appears to be justified by the freedom and impunity with which these acts have been carried out. The pertinence of a specific element of the problem is shortly revealed in the course of any thorough investigation into the mutilations. I refer to the appearance of unmarked and otherwise unidentified helicopters within a spatial and temporal proximity of animal mutilation sites. The occurrence of the two has been persistent enough to supersede coincidence. These mystery helicopters are almost always without identifying markings, or markings may appear to have been painted over, or covered with something. The helicopters are frequently reported flying at abnormal, unsafe or illegal altitudes. They may shy away if witnesses or law officers try to approach. There are several accounts of aggressive behavior on the part of the helicopter occupants, with witnesses chased, buzzed, hovered over, or even fired upon. At times these choppers appear very near mutilation sites, even hovering over a pasture where a mutilated carcass is later found. They may be observed shortly before or after mutilations occur, or within days of a mutilation. The intention here is merely to stress that the mystery helicopter element is a part of the issue which deserves scrutiny. The idea of mystery helicopters did not develop concurrently with the animal mutilations themselves. Such helicopters, unmarked, flying at low levels, soundless, or sounding like helicopters, have been reported for years, and have been linked to an even more widespread phenomenon, the phantom, fixed-wing, aircraft. The helicopters themselves have been seen in area where UFOs were reported, in many countries. In some of the more interesting accounts, the mystery helicopters were seen with UFOs, or shortly after the UFOs were sighted. The most apt case I can think of, but, certainly not the most isolated, is a case described by Virgil Armstrong in his lecture on what NASA didn't tell us about the moon. He discusses helicopters and UFOs in general. Armstrong describes a friend of his that had invented a special camera arrangement with the idea that it would increase the chances of getting good pictures of UFOs. The camera was mounted on a gun stock along with a laser. The idea was to fire the laser at the UFO, if one appeared, and hopefully the UFO would come to a halt, enabling him to take some quality pictures. 
not too long after they were set up in the desert, a UFO did in fact appear, and they fired the laser and the disc stopped in a hovering mode. They took quite a few good pictures of it. Shortly thereafter, the disc flew away. Within minutes, they heard the unmistakable sound of helicopters coming their way. The helicopters landed strategically around their group, and out of the choppers came a group of black berets, which are strategic air force security forces. The commander of the berets walked up to the group and said, what are you doing here? Obviously, we are photographing flying objects, and we just saw a flying saucer and we got some very very good pictures of it. The commander then asked the leader of the group if he knew where he was. The group leader replied no. The commander then said, we suggest you get out of here right now. The group leader then asked, what right do you have to tell us to get out of here? Is this government land? The commander of the Black Berets replied, indeed it is. It is Andrews Air Force Base, and if you are not out of here in 10 minutes, you are under arrest. With that, the Berets removed the film from the camera, and the group left. Not only does this illustrate one kind of instance where UFOs are seen in relationship to helicopters, but, it also illustrates the fact that either some of the discs are ours, or we have a military-slash-government relationship with those who fly them. The helicopters mentioned above are not the mystery ones, but were United States military ones. Another case of military helicopters and United States-owned discs comes from the book UFO Crash at Aztec, by Wendell Stevens. In the book he relates the incident where an Indian was backpacking in the mountains in the vicinity of Area 51, Groom Lake, on the Nellis AFB range north of Las Vegas. He heard approaching helicopters and hid out of sight. The helicopters were broadcasting a warning over public address systems for anyone in the area to show themselves because they were going to conduct a dangerous military test. The Indian maintained his hidden posture, and the helicopters flew overhead and back down toward the Groom Lake facility. Minutes later, two helicopters were seen flying up the canyon with a black disc flying between them and slightly above them. They flew overhead and then the helicopters turned around and flew back towards the base, followed shortly afterward by the disc. The individual's name and how to contact him for further details is given in the book. The Mystery Choppers Situations involving the mystery helicopters appear to be a little more insidious. A good example is an event which occurred in Madison County, Montana, between June and October of 1976. 22 confirmed cattle mutilations had occurred during that period, and they were accompanied by reports throughout the county of silent, unmarked, jet black helicopters, flashing or steady anomalous lights in the air and near the ground, unmarked fixed wing aircraft and white vans in remote and previously inaccessible areas. Toward the latter part of this period, in early autumn of 1976, a hunter from Bozeman, Montana, was out alone around 3 p.m. one day in the Red Mountain area near Norris. He watched as a black helicopter without markings flew overhead and disappeared below a small hill. The curious hunter climbed to the top of the hill. There was the black chopper, a Bell Jet Ranger, he thought, on the ground, the engine still running. Seven men had apparently exited from the craft and were walking up the hill toward the observer. As the hunter advanced towards the seven, he waved and shouted congenial greetings. It was then that he realized there was something odd about the men, they were all oriental. They had slanted eyes and olive skin and were jabbering among themselves in some indecipherable language. They wore everyday clothes, not uniforms. Suddenly they began to return to the helicopter. The hunter, still waving and shouting friendly greetings, started after them. The orientals quickened their pace. When the hunter approached within five or six feet, they broke into a dead run, crowded into the chopper and took off. In a documented mystery helicopter wave in England, accounts place oriental appearing occupants in an unidentified chopper. Slant-eyed, olive-skinned, oriental seeming occupants have been a staple at the heart and at the periphery of UFO accounts for years. Significant numbers of the infamous men in black, MIB, have a similar appearance, but, very often they are seen as very pale and gaunt men who are sensitive to light. In Stigmata No. 5, Fall-Winter 1978, Tom Adams outlined the most prominent speculative explanations accounting for the mutilation-slash-helicopter link, including the following. The helicopters are themselves UFOs, disguised to appear as terrestrial craft. The choppers originate from within the U.S. government-slash-military and are directly involved in conducting the actual mutilations. 
the helicopters are government slash military and are not involved in the mutilations but are investigating them. The helicopters are government slash military, and they know about the identity and motives of the mutilators and by their presence, they are trying to divert attention to the possibility of involvement by the military. The answer, as far as Tom Adams is concerned, could be a combination of the above explanations. There also has been speculation that they are involved in biological experiments with chemical or biological warfare or the geobotanical pursuit of petroleum and mineral deposits. On one occasion, an army standard type scalpel was found at a mutilation site. Since the discs have been mostly involved with the mutilations, it is thought that this was a diversionary event. These events, or the discussion of them, is just the precursor to the actual revelations of what is behind the mutilations, alien acquisition of biological materials for their own use. To discuss this in a logical and sequential manner, we must review what has been really happening right under our noses, direct interaction with extraterrestrial biological entities, EVAs. To discuss that, however, we must attempt to start at the beginning with what we now know to be true. The saga begins. It seemingly all began thousands of years ago, but, for the purposes of this discussion, let's start with some events that we all are familiar with. In 1947, two years after we set off the first nuclear explosion that our current civilization detonated, came the Mantell episode, where we had the first recorded incident of a military confrontation with extraterrestrials that resulted in the death of a military pilot. It is quite evident now that our government did not know quite how to handle the situation. In 1952, the nation's capital was overflown by a series of discs. It was this event which led to the involvement of United States Security Forces, CIA, NSA, DIA, FBI, to try to keep the situation under control until they could understand what was happening. During this period, the government established a working group, known as Majestic 12, MJ-12. The original members were Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencoder, Dr. Vannevar Bush, Secretary James Forrestal, General Nathan P. Twining, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, Drive, Detlev Bronk, Dr. Jerome Hunsaker, Mr. Sidney W. Sowers, Mr. Gordon Gray, Dr. Donald Menzel, General Robert M. Montague, and Dr. Lloyd V. Berkner. The MJ-12 group has been a continuously existing group since it was created, with new members replacing others that die. For example, when Secretary Forrestal was upset at seeing the United States sold out in World War II, he wound up being sent to a naval hospital for emotional strain. Before relatives could get to him, he jumped out a 16th-story window. Most persons close to him consider his suicide contrived. When Forrestal died, he was replaced by General Walter B. Smith. In December of 1947, Project Sign was created to acquire as much information as possible about UFOs, their performance characteristics and their purposes. In order to preserve security, liaison between Project Sign and MJ-12 was limited to two individuals within the Intelligence Division of the Air Materiel Command, whose role it was to pass along certain types of information through channels. Project Sign evolved into Project Grudge in December, 1948. Project Grudge had an over-civilian counterpart named Project Blue Book, with which we are all familiar. Only safe reports were passed to Blue Book. In 1949, MJ-12 evolved an initial plan of contingency called MJ-194904 P-78 that was to make allowance for public disclosure of some data should the necessity present itself. Majestic 12 was originally organized by General George C. Marshall in July, 1947 to study the Roswell Magdalena UFO crash recovery and debris. Admiral Hillencoder, director of the CIA from May 1, 1947, until September, 1950, decided to activate the Robertson Panel, which was designed to monitor civilian UFO study groups that were appearing all over the country. He also joined NICAP in 1956 and was chosen as a member of its board of directors. It was from this position that he was able to act as the MJ-12 mole, along with his team of other covert experts. They were able to steer NICAP in any direction they wanted to go. With the Flying Saucer program under complete control of MJ-12 and with the physical evidence hidden away, General Marshall felt more at ease with this very bizarre situation. 
these men and their successors have most successfully kept most of the public fooled for 39 years, including much of the Western world, by setting up false experts and throwing their influence behind them to make their plan work, with considerable success. Until now. Within six months of the Roswell crash on July 2, 1947 and the finding of another crashed UFO at San Augustine Flats near Magdalena, New Mexico, on July 3, 1947, a great deal of reorganization of agencies and shuffling of people took place. The main thrust behind the original security lid, and the very reason for its construction, was the analysis and attempted duplication of the technologies of the disks. That activity is headed up by the following groups. The Research and Development Board, RAN DB. Air Force Research and Development, AFRD. The Office of Naval Research, ONR. CIA Office of Scientific Intelligence, CIA OC. NSA Office of Scientific Intelligence, NSA OC. No single one of these groups was supposed to know the whole story. Each group was to know only the parts that MJ-12 allowed them to know. MJ-12 also operates through the various civilian intelligence and investigative groups. The CIA and the FBI are manipulated by MJ-12 to carry out their purposes. The NSA was created in the first place to protect the secret of the recovered flying disks, and eventually got complete control over all communications intelligence. This control allows the NSA to monitor any individual through mail, telephone, telexes, telegrams, and now through online computers, monitoring private and personal communications as they choose. In fact, the present-day NSA is the current main extension of MJ-12 pertaining to the Flying Saucer program. Vast amounts of disinformation are spread throughout the UFO research field. Any witnesses to any aspect of the program have their lives monitored in every detail, for each has signed a security oath. For people who have worked in the program, including military members, breaking that oath could have any on of the following direct consequences. A verbal warning accompanied by a review of the security oath. A stronger warning, sometimes accompanied by a brow beating and intimidation. Psychologically working on an individual to bring on depression that will lead to suicide. Murder of the person made to appear as a suicide or accident. Strange and sudden accidents, always fatal. Confinement in special detention centers. Confinement in insane asylums where they are treated by mind control and deprogramming techniques. Individuals are released with changed personalities, identities, and altered memories bringing the individual into the inside, where he is employed and works for them, and where he can be watched. This is usually in closed facilities with little contact with the outside world. Underground facilities are the usual place for this. Any individual who they perceive to be too close to the truth will be treated in the same manner. MJ-12 will go to any length to preserve and protect the ultimate secret. As we will see later, the characteristics of what this ultimate secret would turn out to be would change drastically for it was something even MJ-12 could not predict, actual contact with alien groups. How the actual contact between the government and aliens was initially made is not known, but, the government was made aware that it could be done by a civilian using the right equipment. Dr. Paul Benwitz, civilian scientist, did so using computer equipment and informed the government he had done so, not realizing that by then, in 1983, that the government was in truth as deep into dealing with the aliens as his communications with them revealed. Dr. Benwitz lives next to Manzano Weapons Storage Area in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He observed UFOs constantly over the area and initially decided that they were a threat to the installation. He proceeded to figure out a coding system and attempted and was successful in communicating with the aliens that were flying over that area. What he found out is that after initial contacts with the aliens years ago, we agreed to, to provide them with bases underground in the United States in return for certain technological secrets which the aliens would reveal to us. The aliens would also be allowed to carry out certain operations, abductions, and mutilations without intervention. The original contact between the government and the extraterrestrial biological entities, who are gray in color and about 3.5 to 4.5 feet high, hereafter referred to as the grays, was achieved between 1947 and 1951. We knew that the Greys were instrumental in performing the mutilations of animals, and some humans, and that they were using the glandular substances derived from these materials for food, absorbed through the skin, and to clone more Greys in their underground laboratories. 
the government was also aware that the Greys performed some of the abductions to secure genetic materials. The government insisted that the Greys provide them with a list that would be presented to the National Security Council. Through all this, the government thought that the Greys were basically tolerable creatures, although a bit distasteful. They presumed at the time that it was not unreasonable to assume that the public would and could get used to their presence. Between 1968 and 1969 a plan was formulated to make the public aware of their existence over the succeeding 20 years. This time period would culminate with a series of documentaries that would explain the history and intentions of the Greys. The Greys assured us that the real purpose of the abductions was for monitoring of our civilization, and when we learned that the abductions were a lot more frequent and insidious than we were led to believe, the government became concerned. Their concern was also based on additional information regarding the purposes for the abductions. Insertion of a 3mm spherical biological monitoring device through the nasal cavity into the brain of the abductee. Implementing subliminal post-hypnotic suggestions that would compel the abductee to perform some specific act at a time to be within the next 2-5 to five years. Genetic crossbreeding between the greys and human beings. Insertion of discoid monitoring devices into the muscle tissue of the abductees. Presence of these has been verified by X-ray. By the time we had found out the truth about the intentions of the greys, they intend to stay here and stay in control of our world, it was too late. We had already sold out humanity. Not that it would have made any difference, because, they were here doing what they were doing anyway. In 1983, a story was outlined by government sources that said that the greys are responsible for our biological evolution through manipulation of the DNA of already evolving primates on this planet. Various time intervals of the DNA manipulation were specified for 25,000, 15,000, 5,000, and 2,500 years ago. Originally, the government thought that the greys meant us no harm, but, today, in 1988, the picture that is emerging is exactly the opposite. The story now is one of great deception at several different levels, the Greys Trojan horse style manipulation and lying which allied MJ-12 forces with them four decades ago, the government's disinformation of the subject of UFOs in order to perpetuate the agreement with the Greys free of public scrutiny, the lies to the abductees, the Greys ongoing abduction of people and mutilation of animals in order to harvest enzymes, blood and other tissues for their own survival needs, and a genetic blend of the grey race and a tall Nordic race to enable grey interface with humans to be done with greater ease. Information from a source at a Southwest Army base reveals that these multiple levels of deception are true. It is also indicated that the goal of SDI, Star Wars, is actually to follow through with an attack, proposed by the greys, on the Nordics when they arrive en masse between now and 1992. This time schedule seems to match with the post-hypnotic programming of many abductees for actions between the next two to five years. This same source sees the world dominated and controlled by the greys in a way similar to that portrayed in the V television series, they are concerned only for their own survival agenda, and this agenda requires biological substances from other life forms on our planet. The apparent reasoning for the grey preoccupation with this is due to their lack of a formal digestive tract and the fact that they absorb nutrients and excrete waste directly through the skin. The substances that they acquire are mixed with hydrogen peroxide and painted on their skin, allowing absorption of the required nutrients. It is construed from this that some weaponry against them might be geared in this direction. Observations by a visiting Nordic In October, 1987, UFO researcher George Andrews was successfully able to contact one of the Nordics not associated with the Greys, through a woman in California. What follows are the comments made by the alien. Were you a culture about to invade, you would not do it with a flourish of ships showing up in the heavens and undergo risk of being fired upon. That's the type of warfare slightly less evolved beings get into. You would create intense confusion and disagreement with only inferences to your presence, inferences which would, in turn, cause controversial disagreement. The greys are insidious little fiends. They did exactly, to us, what they're doing here, to you. You are not on the verge of an invasion. You are not in the middle of an invasion. The invasion has already taken place. It's merely in its final stages. What would you invade? Here he describes the operational plan of the greys from the beginning, you would go to the most secretive communities within a society. In the case of the United States, you would go and infiltrate the CIA. 
you would take over some of them and you would take over part of the KGB. You would create great dissension and disagreement between factions of the public at large, some groups saying they have seen UFOs, others saying no, no, this is not possible. You would involve two major countries in an ongoing idiotic philosophical disagreement so that while the Soviet Union and the United States constantly battle back and forth about who is which piece of territory or whether one invades Iran or whether one invades Afghanistan or whatever. Whether one dismantles one nuclear warhead or the other dismantles another group of warheads, you would sit back and laugh if you had the capacity to laugh. You would present yourself indeed to some in a group who would protect you, CIA or MJ-12 thinking they had a secret more secret and more perfect knowledge of something than anyone else on this planet had, and they would covet you and you would trust their own greed and you would trust their own mass stupidity to trap them. And you'd do it on both sides. You'd show yourself to some of the mass populace to further involve, factions of, the government in an attempt to shut them up, to keep them even more busy quieting them and trying to stop more information about UFOs from getting out. You'd have the mass populace to a state where they distrusted the government. Oh, why don't they believe us? Why can't they understand that these things are really happening? We're not crazy. So you would have battles constantly about whether UFOs exist or they don't exist. You would have the public and the government at each other's throats. You would set two major superpowers at each other's throats, and you would have set up groups like haves, the wealthy but contented, and the have nots. You would plant the seeds of massive discontent. Eventually you might have some show of ships landing in the 1990s. One or two. By the time they have landed, be assured they will be in complete control. You will start doing crossbreeds and more crossbreeds, generation after generation. You bribe the government with a few tidbits, a Star Wars system. You tease and tempt the Soviet Union with a laser system far finer than any of their own scientists could think of. And you always have that subtle inference, just on the borderline of consciousness so that UFOs don't seem too believable, yet, you keep it couched in secrecy and make it seem quite so insane that no one would believe them. On top of it, you would unleash forces that would want to kill them, UFO contactees, if they disclose that. The CIA is dealing with the exact same things the, contact victim, is. Maybe one or two hundred years from now, some of the greys will even physically mingle and you may have some creatures walking around who are pretty much hybrids between greys and your own race. For now, anything that walks around will look much like yourselves. It's simpler. It holds down on mass panic. Everyone who has experiences with them, greys, will be at odds with the government. To add to that, we will go into a complete phase of earthquake after earthquake and upheaval after upheaval. The inner core of the CIA is deeply controlled by the Greys. The CIA sees interaction with the Greys as a path to greater scientific achievement. One reason you are seeing so many different kinds of UFOs is that other cultures are watching with extreme interest. Scientists from other cultures arrive to watch. The Greys have not only taken over the intelligence agencies, they have also taken over what those agencies call lunatic fringe groups. Well, that's what the Nordic had to say. The source of this also makes the following commentary. The ultimate evil is that masked form of psychological complacency that leads one to adhere to a group philosophy rather than eke out one's own horizons. As soon as you acquire an awareness of being a so-called chosen special group, you are on the way to a fall. That is the seed of destruction in any society and any culture and it leaves it vulnerable. It will be the eventual undoing of the greys as well. They see not their error, it is the very weakness they seize upon that is their own inherent weakness. To try and change a grey, or a cultish type of star person, or a CIA member is futile. It will happen, but, all in its own good time. It is the spirit that makes anyone stand up and disagree with something that is untrue and incorrect that will be the thorn in the side of the greys, and the other forces that have allied with them. During the occupation of the greys, they have established quite a number of underground bases all over the world, especially in the United States. One such base, among others in the same state, is under Archuleta Mesa, which is about 2.5 miles northwest of Dulce, New Mexico. Details about that base have come across by way of two sources. The first source is by way of an abduction of a woman and her son who witnessed the pickup of a calf for extraction of biological materials. In May, 1980, 
a most interesting case occurred in northern New Mexico. A mother and her son were driving on a rural highway near Cimarron when they observed two craft in the process of abducting a calf. Both of them were then abducted and taken on separate craft to the underground installation, where the woman witnessed the mutilation of the calf. It was alleged that she also observed vats containing cattle body parts floating in a liquid, and another vat containing the body of a male human. The woman was subjected to an exam and it was further alleged that small metallic objects were implanted into her body as well as into her son's body. More than one source has informed us that CAT scans have confirmed the presence of these implants. The above extract is from a transcript of a conversation between Jim McCampbell and Dr. Paul Benwitz on July 13, 1984. Benwitz reports that through regressive hypnosis of the mother and child, required only in about 30% of abduction cases, and his own follow-up investigation, including communications received via his computer terminal, which are ostensibly from a UFO-related source, he was able to determine the location of the underground facility, a kilometer underground beneath Archuleta Mesa on the Hickoria Apache Indian Reservation near Dulce, New Mexico, since 1976, one of the areas of the U.S. hardest hit by mutilations. Benwitz's information is that this installation is operated jointly as part of an ongoing program of cooperation between the U.S. government and EBAs. There are also underground bases at Kirtland AFB and Holloman AFB, as well as at scores of other bases around the world, including Bentwaters, England. Back to the base under discussion. After Benwitz briefed Air Force officials on what he had found, a trip to the area revealed the following data. The base is 2.5 miles northwest of Dulce, and almost overlooks the town. There is a level highway 36 feet wide going into the area. It is a government road. One can see telemetry trailers and buildings that are five-sided with a dome. Next to the domes, a black limousine was noted, a CIA vehicle. These limos will run you off the road if you try to get into the area. To the north there is a launch site. There are two wrecked ships there, they are 36 feet long with wings, and one can see oxygen and hydrogen tanks. The ships that we got out of the trade are atomic powered with plutonium pellets. Refueling of the plutonium is accomplished at Los Alamos. The base has been there since 1948. Some of the discs are piloted by the NSA. The base is 4,000 feet long and helicopters are going in and out of there all the time. When it became known that Benwitz was familiar with this, the mutilations in the area stopped. In 1979, something happened and the base was temporarily closed. There was an argument over weapons and our people were chased out. The aliens killed 66 of our people, and 44 got away. One of the people who in fact got away was a CIA agent who, before leaving, made some notes, photos, and videotapes, and went into hiding. He has been in hiding ever since, and every six months he contacts each of five people he left copies of the material with. His instructions were that if he missed four successive contacts, the people could do whatever they want with the material. This agent calls an individual known to MUFON. Somehow, a description of the Dulce papers was issued, and was received in December, 1987, by many researchers. The Dulce papers were composed of 25 black and white photos, a videotape with no dialogue and a set of papers that included technical information regarding the jointly occupied, U.S. alien, facility one kilometer beneath the Archuleta Mesa near Dulce, New Mexico. The facility still exists and is currently operational. It is believed that there are four additional facilities of the same type, one being located a few miles to the southeast of Groom Lake, Nevada. A general description of what these papers contain is that they contain documents that discuss copper and molybdenum, and papers that discuss magnesium and potassium, but mostly papers about copper. Sheets of paper with charts and strange diagrams. Papers that discuss UV light and gamma rays. These papers tell what the aliens are after and how the blood, taken from cattle, is used. The aliens seem to absorb atoms to eat. They put their hands in blood, sort of like a sponge, for nourishment. It's not just food they want, the DNA in cattle and humans is being altered. The type 1 creature is a lab animal. They know how to change the atoms to create a temporary almost human being. It is made with animal tissue and depends on a computer to simulate memory, a memory the computer has withdrawn from another human. Clones. The almost human being is slow and clumsy. 
real humans are used for training, to experiment with and to breed with these almost humans. Some humans are kidnapped and used completely. Some are kept in large tubes, and are kept alive in an amber liquid. Some humans are brainwashed and used to distort the truth. Certain male humans that have a high sperm count and are kept alive. Their sperm is used to alter the DNA and create a non-gender being. Called type 2. That sperm is grown in some way and altered again, and put in wombs. They resemble ugly humans when growing but look normal when fully grown, which only takes a few months from. Fetus size. They have a short lifespan, less than a year. Some female humans are used for breeding. Countless women have had a sudden miscarriage after about three months pregnancy. Some never know they were pregnant, others remember contact some way. The fetus is used to mix the DNA and types 1 and 2. The atomic makeup in that fetus is half human, half almost human, and would not survive in the mother's womb. It is taken at three months and grown elsewhere. Well, that's what the Dulce Papers Review says. There are some pen and ink reproductions of some of the photos made in the laboratories, 3, an illustration of what one of the wombs looks like, 2x4, an illustration showing one of the tubes where one of the almost humans is grown, a page showing a simple diagram of crystalline metal, pure gold crystal, and what looks like either a genetic or metallurgical diagram or chart. Also attached is what looks like an X-ray diffraction pattern and a diagram of hexagonal crystals, with a comment that they are best for electrical conduction. It would appear that the last half of material in the review applies to the supercrystalline metal used for hull structure, or something along that line. Obviously, this is all rather bizarre from a certain point of view, any point of view, in fact. Nevertheless, material that is supported by years of descriptions and multitudes of corroborations must mean something, especially when bumped against what is seen to be going on. It is apparent from this and other data that has been accumulated over the years, that there are underground bases and tunnel complexes all over the world, and that more are being constructed all the time. Many of you may recall the Shaver Mysteries and Inner Earth City stories. Well, all that is true. There are cities down there, amongst other things, and some of them have nothing to do with the main subject of this paper. They've been there for a long time. Let's change direction for a moment. One individual by the name of Lou Terry has been working on some ideas regarding UFOs and geomagnetic anomalies. I will go into what he has discovered, although the concept of the relationship is not new, and let you judge that for yourself. After purchasing aeromagnetic and gravitational anomaly maps from the United States Geological Survey, it becomes evident that there was indeed a valid connection between these areas and UFOs. Mr. Terry gave a lecture in Arizona about that relationship, and was subsequently harassed by the FBI, and told that the information is sensitive. Mr. Terry took the hint and declined to talk publicly about it to the degree that he had been doing. Both the aeromagnetic and gravitational, bougier gravity, maps indicate basic field strength, as well as areas of high and low field strength. Interestingly enough, the areas of maximum and minimum field strength have the following. All have frequent UFO sightings. All are either on Indian reservations, government land, or the government is trying to buy up the land. Many of them, especially where several are clustered together, are suspected bases areas and or areas where mutilations and abductions have historically taken place. In these observations, Mr. Terry has gone far, but, he has gone a little farther in noting that there are times when the UFOs are seen in these areas. Through painstaking research, Mr. Terry found that the sightings, as well as many abductions and mutilations, occur on the new moon or within two days before the new moon. On the full moon or within two days before the full moon. At the perihelion, moon closest to Earth, or within two days before the perihelion. A glance at the nearest farmer's almanac will give you the information you require as far as the days for this year or any other one. There seems to be no concrete explanation for the coincidence of the times and the events, but it is true. The men in black. All things considered, UFO research has become pretty much of a circus today, and the most intriguing and controversial sideshow skirting the edges is the question of the silencers, or the mysterious men in black. There is a strong subliminal appeal in these accounts of visits by mysterious dark-suited figures, I have been visited myself, as have others I've known, attempting to silence UFO witnesses. 
A typical situation would be that a witness has a UFO sighting or UFO related experience. Shortly thereafter, he is visited by one or more odd looking men who relate to him the minutest details of his experience, even though he has as yet told no one for fear of ridicule or other reasons. The men warn him about spreading the story of his experience around and sometimes even threaten him personally, sometimes obliquely, sometimes directly. Any evidence, if it exists, is confiscated in one way or another. Sometimes the visit is for some totally meaningless reason and the subject of UFOs is hardly mentioned, if at all. But again, the men all seem to look alike. We actually seem to find ourselves in close proximity to beings who obviously must be directly connected in some way with the objects themselves or the source behind them, yet they seem to be functioning unobtrusively within the framework of our own everyday existence. The classic conception of an MIB is a man of indefinite age, medium height and dressed completely in black. He always has a black hat and often a black turtleneck sweater. They present an appearance often described as strange or odd. They speak in a dull monotone voice, like a computer, and are dark complected with high cheekbones, thin lips, pointed chin, and eyes that are mildly slanted. The visitors themselves are often on absurd missions. They have reportedly posed as salesmen, telephone repairmen or representatives from official or unofficial organizations. Their mode of transportation is usually large and expensive cars, Buicks or Lincolns, sometimes Cadillacs, all black, of course. I might note at this point that their physical appearance also has included beings that have pale grayish skin, and that some of them have been seen to have blonde hair, yet they wear the clothing and drive the cars previously described. Their cars often operate with the headlights off, but ghostly purple or greenish glows illuminate the interior. Unusual insignia have been seen emblazoned on the doors and the license plates are always unidentifiable or untraceable. The fabric of their clothes has been described as strangely shiny or thin, but not silky, almost as if they have been cut from a new type of fabric. Their often mechanical behavior has caused them to be described by some as being like robots or androids, think back to the Dulce lab. A lot of descriptions of some of these folks are pretty bizarre. A businessman's family in Wildwood, New Jersey, was visited by an unusually large man whose pants legs hiked up when he sat down revealing a green wire grafted onto his skin and running up his leg. There are other cases of MIB appearing on the other side of a wet, muddy field after a heavy rain, but having no mud whatever on their brightly shined shoes and in the bitter cold, out of nowhere, wearing only a thin coat. Their shoes and wallets all seem new and hardly broken in. They are not alone. They seem to have faceless conspirators in the nation's post offices and phone companies. Researchers and witnesses often report their mail going astray at an unusually high rate and being bothered by bizarre phone calls where they are spoken to by metallic, unhuman-sounding voices. Unusual noises on the phone, intensifying whenever UFOs are mentioned, and voices breaking in on conversations, have all led many people to suspect that their phones are being tapped. One can't discuss the MIB for long without mentioning the name of John A. Keel, an author who has written much about them. Keel has done more than any other writer to publicize this bizarre aspect of the UFO situation. Keel suggests that the UFO are part of the environment itself and come from another time-space continua, that most of the UFO phenomena is psychic and psychological rather than physical. Well, I personally would not define it that way, although those two components are certainly deeply involved in what's going on. The first noted appearance of the MIB was in 1947, at the scene of the Maury Island incident where some debris was ejected from a disc, and subsequently recovered by officials, who loaded them on an army bomber which crashed on takeoff. To illustrate a little how bizarre some of the incidents are regarding the MIB, I have assembled a short list of some of the more interesting factors in some cases. An ex-Air Force man is gassed and interrogated by MIB after he has learned classified NASA secrets. Close-up photos of UFOs were seized from a teenager who is also directly threatened by MIB. MIB sighted in the lobby of the U.S. State Department leave a mysterious artifact. MIB poses Air Force officers to silence witnesses. MIB tries to buy before hours coke and sings to birds in trees. MIB disintegrates a coin in a witness hand and tells him that his heart will do the same if he talks. Gray physiology and anatomy. 
the approximate height of most specimens is between 3.5 and 4.5 feet. The head, by human standards, is large in comparison with the body. Facial features show a pair of eyes described as large, sunken, or deeply set, far apart, or distended more than the human, and slightly slanted as oriental or mongoloid. No ear lobes or apertures on the side of the head were seen. The nose is vague. One or toe holes have been mentioned. The mouth area is described as a small slit or fissure. In some cases there is no mouth at all. It appears not to function as a means for communication or for food. The neck area is described as being thin, in some instances not being visible at all because of the tightly knit garment. Most observers describe these humanoids as being hairless. Some of the bodies recovered have a slight hair patch atop the head. Others have what appears to be like a silver skullcap. There were no breathing attachments or communications devices. This suggests telepathy with higher intelligence? In one instance there was an opening in the right frontal lobe area, revealing a crystalline network. This network implies the development of a third brain. The arms are described as long and thin, reaching down to the knee section. The hangers each contain four fingers, with no thumbs. Three fingers are longer than the other. Some are very long. Some are very long. Others are very short. No description is available of the legs and feet. Some pathologists indicate that that section of the body was not developed as we would anticipate, showing that some of these beings were adapted to life in the water. There was a webbing effect between the fingers on most of the specimens. According to most observers, the skin is gray. Some claim it is beige, tan or pinkish gray. No reproductive organs or capabilities were discovered. No phallus. No womb. Confirms cloning mentioned by other sources. The humanoids appear to be from a mold, sharing identical racial and biological characteristics. There is no blood as we know it, but, there is a fluid which is grayish in color. The taxonomy of extraterrestrial humanoids, another offering by George Andrews, yields some other observations. Working under the instructions of the humanoids from Rigel, the Greys, CIA and former Nazi scientists have developed and deployed malignant strains of bacteria and viruses, including AIDS, in order to exterminate undesirable elements of the human population. The Greys are almost entirely devoid of emotions, but can obtain a high by telepathically tuning in the different kinds of intense human emotion, such as ecstasy or agony. Does that explain why UFOs have always been seen in regions of war and human conflict? There are over 1,000 humans in the United States alone who are the offspring of intergalactic or extragalactic beings and terrestrial humans. The son of an acquaintance of, deleted in original, is one. Throughout recorded history, as well as during prehistoric times, there has been constant genetic manipulation of an interbreeding with humans in order to breed out the less evolved simian traits. The Nordic races have participated in this from the beginning, and we are as much a part of them as we might suppose. Greys have the ability to camouflage themselves as tall blondes through mental energy projection. Blondes never project themselves as greys. Some blondes seen with the greys are physically real, but are prisoners of the greys who have either paralyzed them or have destroyed their ability to teleport through time and other dimensions. Note a lot of the material obtained by George Andrews has as its source a blonde that is a time traveler that escaped the gray takeover of their system. Both blondes and greys have the ability to disintegrate matter into energy and then reintegrate the energy back into matter. This ability allows them to pass through walls and to transport abductees out of their cars with the doors still locked. The original regalians were the blondes until they were invaded by the greys, a parasitic race, who took over and interbred with them. The original Regalians were the ones who seeded the earth. It is because of this common ancestry that terrestrial humanity is of such interest to both the blondes and the greys. Terrestrial human females can be impregnated either on board ship or while they sleep in their homes. Males need not be manifested in visible form for this to occur. The blondes now habitate the Procyon system. The conflict between the blondes and the greys is in a state of temporary truce, although the conflict between the Rigelian and the Sirius system is being fought actively. The blondes with speech abilities will respond violently if attacked or threatened, but the telepathic ones will respond peacefully. 
Blondes were sometimes mistaken for angels in earlier centuries. They do not seem to age, and consistently appear to be from 27 to 35 human years old. Confused? Well, now you can see why the natural diversity of the way things are are hard to sort out for the average researcher. The probability that this information is true or partially true remains fairly high, based on analysis of what we know about abductions and general contact between humans and EBS that has been documented. Real Esoterica, Sirius and the MIB Let's regress for a moment back to the MIB. According to John Keel, the MIB often state that they are representatives of the nation of the third eye. Based on some of the info we have already researched, it is apparent that Sirius has been in contact with us for a long time. According to George Hunt Williamson, one of the early contactees, in his book Other Tongues, Other Flesh, the Earth Allies of Sirius, i.e., the secret societies, use the Eye of Horus as an insignia. This symbol has also been seen on the MIB. Secret societies believe that there is a great white lodge on Earth. They call it Shambhala, and consider it to be the spiritual center of the world. Now, theosophists such as Alice Bailey, say that the Great White Lodge is on Sirius. If the all-seeing eye is a symbol of Sirius Earth allies and the MIB wear that symbol, and if Shambhala represents the Great White Lodge on Earth, then the MIB are emissaries of Shambhala. Sirius and Shambhala are two sides of the same coin. This is verified in the book The Undiscovered Country, by Stephen Jenkins. Jenkins was told by Buddhist priests that Shambhala was located in the constellation of Orion. The entrance to Shambhala on Earth is usually placed in the Trans-Himalayan region. Some assert it is in the heart of the Gobi Desert, where there have been allegations of crash disks and bases. According to the explorer Nicholas Rurik, there are caves in the Himalayan foothills that have subterranean passages. In one of the these passages, there is a stone door that has never been opened, because, the time for its opening has not yet arrived. In 1930, Doriel founded the Brotherhood of the White Temple. He says that the entrance to Shambhala is far underground. He goes on to say that space bends around Shambhala, and that there is a warp which leads into another universe. Let's get back to something we can have more of a direct handle on. Many times psychics have been called upon by investigative authorities to evaluate situations, and in many cases what they have contributed has been very helpful. This was done in the case of animal mutilations back in 1980 by Peter Jordan, who engaged several psychics to render their impressions from photos and maps of mutilations and mutilation areas. What follows is a condensation of what was found during this exercise. Name of Psychic, Ronald Mangravite? This animal has been dead a few days. Some parts are decaying faster than others. There is an overload of electrolytes in the body possibly due to injection of a citrate. Something wrong with blood. Picking up higher portion of plasma which may be lymphatic fluid. Two men working on the animal. Very sharp surgical knives. Men dressed in black. Jumpsuits. Shiny black nylon. Winch line coming down from chopper. Men are skilled ex-military. Something is going to be done with the tissue. Fluorometry connection. Spectrophotometers. Choppers are brown or gray. Underground implications. Experimentation with different analytical techniques. Name of psychic, Elizabeth Lerner. Paramilitary forces. A serious invasion of American privacy. Non-American Indians part of secret project. The word anide. The word Carmen or Carmen. The symbol DK. A new wave of mutilations will strike near southwest New Mexico. The Hobart Company is involved in this. Refrigeration equipment? Three huge, donut shaped objects will be seen in conjunction with these new mutilations. Breakthrough in research. Muscle relaxant injections. Someone with the name Impeta. This is a Mexican operation. Names Keelman and Kelman. Institution with many Lincoln Continentals and Cadillacs. Laboratory Underground. Lily Pharmaceuticals. Roman numerals E5, sick. Name Stefano. The number 1714. Last name Odler. First name Mace. Last name Oddly. Jet Rocket Labs nearby. Domes above the ground. Vehicle ID hash MP 1936. 
Small Jeeps. Last name Plento. Initial CBP heads operation. Wears brown military shoes. Army. Number 1161. Around an oil field. Place where oil crosses in an X pattern. Chemical engineering connections. Mustard. Periscope device on bottom of craft. Chopper called the shark. Man with blonde hair. English features. High forehead. Wears square ring. Insignia reads CBP has something to do with ammunition. Colonel. Name of psychic, Nancy Fuchs. Dusk scene. Men talking about some animal's throat. Something missing. Cylindrical object. Long thick object inserted into jugular vein. Powerful energy flow emanating from device used to kill cattle. Feeling of tremendous anger and hostility. Research implication. Minerals needed for research. Intimidation of Rancher Gomez. Embryos. Thousands of samples needed for this breeding effect. Crossbreeding. Animal dies in seconds. Jolts of electricity through animal. Breeding and genetics involved. Army background. Liquid-filled shoes leave no prints. Marshal. Army. Cap with black rim and gold braid. Pompous. White-haired. Very influential. Walks into Pentagon whenever he pleases. Commission given 15 to 18 years ago for mutilation project when he was overseas. Grand Marshal. Friend of General MacArthur. Lives in Dakotas. Money invested. High priority issue. Tall. Heavy set. Only 17 people know of this. Project with $2.5 million allocated early in game for breeding experimentation. Late 1960s through Pentagon. More and more money invested every year. Land wanted. Want to destroy ranchers' prime source of income. John Mitchell connected to this. Howard Hughes. Uranium connection. Picture complex. Faction ridden. Interest in speeding up growth of cattle. Importance of pancreas? Well, there you have that little presentation. I don't know what exactly to make of it, but there it is. Certainly a non-UFO implication here, however, it only relates to three mutilations. How about the other 10,000, most of which have the UFO connection? What did I tell you about a multi-level reality? At this point, I will put some references and excerpts from some volumes that I believe are relevant to all the things we've been talking about. Where I feel it is applicable, I will comment on them. The Goblin Universe P222 The ability to materialize mental constructs is not unknown. Suppose one creates a field with a mind that is strong enough to attract supercharged particles. The particles are real but, unstable in their assemblage since the stability depends on the intermediate mental component. P223 Physical aspect of UFOs and other phenomena lie in the behavior of electromagnetic fields. P124 If all UFO incidents were chance encounters, someone would have obtained a filmed record or a series of stills years ago. The only way that such episodes can be engineered so that they remain total mysteries is for the entities to have advanced knowledge of any situation before it occurs. P117, referencing John Keel, these entities labor to cultivate belief in various frames of reference, and then they create new manifestation which support those beliefs. P120, illness is common after close contact with some beings. P122, Guy Underwood classified primary geomagnetic currents into three classes, water lines, aquastats, and track lines. Some magnetic signals appear as spirals, others are linear. Gnats and flies congregate above magnetic patterns. Extraterrestrials among us. P23, on several occasions after UFOs flew over missile sites, it was found that the targeting of the missiles had changed, and the warheads had to be replaced. P3, on June 22, 1980 a UFO that was 10 miles in diameter was reported over the Kuwait oil fields. P4, on July 30, 1985, a UFO over Mongolia that was 10 kilometers in diameter was reported heading south. 
It was sighted by a Chinese jet and reported in the Japan Times. The United States ignored this report. P8, JANAP 146 specifies up to 10 years in prison and $10,000 in fines for anyone in government service who makes unauthorized public statements about UFO phenomena. The British Official Secrets Act makes similar provisions. P9, many routes of UFOs take the form of an isosceles triangle. P16, on September 14, 1978, a UFO as big as an ocean liner flew over Italy, and over Rome on the 15th and 16th. Comment, this was two weeks before Pope John Paul I was found dead under suspicious circumstances. He was killed between September 28th to 29th. Autopsy was refused. It was rumored he intended to reveal the Fatima message of 1917. P20, UFOs dart around in daylight at speeds which cannot be seen. P22, an individual having one CE experience usually has another. P24, there is no basis to support psychiatric pathology for UFO witnesses. P24, Dr. Brian T. Clifford, Pentagon, announces on October 5, 1982, that contact between U.S. citizens and extraterrestrials on their vehicles is illegal. Title 14, Section 1211 of the Code of Federal Regulations, adopted July 16, 1969, before the first manned lunar landing, says that anyone guilty of this becomes a wanted criminal to be jailed for one year and fined $5,000. The NASA administrator is empowered to determine with or without a hearing that a person has been ET exposed and impose indeterminate quarantine under armed guard, which cannot be broken even by court order. P89, Mars has a history of transient phenomena. P90, temporary brilliant spots on Mars were reported by astronomers in 1890, 1892, 1900, 1911, 1924, 1937, 1952, 1954, 1967, and 1971. The distribution was non-random. Intensely dark spots, transient in nature, were reported on Mars in 1925, 1952, and 1954. P93, about 33% of abductees are able to remember the experiences without hypnotic regression. 66% of the abductees were alone when abducted. P94, some abductees did not return but vanished permanently or were found dead after a UFO encounter. P25, Records of the 687 BC battle between the Assyrians and the Hebrews indicate that a blast from heaven reduced the bodies of 185,000 Assyrians to ashes but left their clothes intact. P145, Morris K. Jessup died under mysterious circumstances after a copy of his book Case for the UFO was sent to the Chief of the Office of Naval Research, ONR, in Washington. P146, Comments from Case for the UFO Falls from the Sky of Flesh blood, reptiles, etc., were due to either spoiled food or cleaning of holding tanks. Comments, describe two different space races who share the planet with us without our knowledge. They are not visitors, they have been here longer than we have. They feel more at ease in the ocean. The little men were almost wiped out by a serpent race identified only as the S-men. S-men are ravenous for red meat, extremely materialistic, and are greedy for power. Comment, sounds like the Darrows of Shavarian fame. P147, thanks to Alan Dulles in partnership with Reinhard Gecklin, the Gestapo was transplanted intact into the United States system as the CIA, without the knowledge or consent of American citizens. Comment, remember Reagan placing wreaths on graves of SS stormtroopers at the 40th anniversary of World War II? Roots of that symbolic gesture go deep. P147, reference the Intelligence Identity Protection Act of 1981, freedom to speak about anything but the CIA. Some claim that concentration camps have already been built. Activation was sealed by Executive Order Rex 84. The next Rex exercise in, in 1988. P-148, Jessup, I believe that space structures of 5 to 10 miles in diameter are sufficiently large to produce intelligently directed storms. P-150, alleged alien comment in annotated edition of Case for the UFO, men frozen helpless make good prey. P-151, 
Dr. James E. McDonald thought that the Federal Power Commission was evading the evidence concerning UFO involvement in the total power failure that paralyzed New York on July 13, 1965, and dared to say so in front of a congressional committee. P-152, on June 13, 1971, James E. McDonald was found dead under mysterious circumstances, shot through the head with a pistol by his side. P-153, Murder disguised as suicide is one of the well-known specialties of the CIA. P-153, there is ample documentation suggesting that among the highest priority covert operations of the CIA are those supplying heroin to the mafia. The war on drugs is in fact a war on the independent drug dealer who constitutes a threat to the mafia monopoly. Comment, additional ways to subdue the population or eliminate undesirables? P-156, Karen Silkwood's murder disguised as auto accident. P-159, George Adamski, contactee in the 1950s had a special government passport. Possible CIA disinformation agent. P-162, although mutilations were reported in England as early as 1904 to 1905, winter of weirdness, the large-scale operations there began in 1973. P-163, a rancher and his son saw a UFO as big as a hotel which was accompanied by four smaller ones. Rectangular in shape, 300 to 400 feet long, and 60 feet high. A helicopter approached it and turned into a small UFO. P-163, phantom cars appear on roads, follow people, and disappear. P-163, a rancher and his wife looked at a UFO five-eighths of a mile away and reported that two appendages emerged from the egg-shaped object. P-164, apparently UFOs have the capability of invisibility. P-164, materialization of a Bigfoot before a witness. P-164, dematerialization of Bigfoot before witness who shot it with a 16-gauge shotgun at point-blank range into its stomach. P-166, on August 21, 1975, a sheriff was chasing an unmarked helicopter in his plane in southwestern Nebraska at 0430 when the lights on the helicopter went out, and the only thing seen on the ground was a missile silo. P-166, about the time mutilations began in earnest, 1973 wave, a new branch of science was beginning to develop, biogeochemistry, analysis of mineral and oil deposits by analysis of tissues of herbivorous animals. P-168, an elderly lady in Arkansas in 1979 injured herself and was cut during a fall. The injuries were repaired by two aliens, who gave her a piece of metal with pyramids and six pointed stars on it. The aliens told her they consumed juice, but, not the kind consumed by humans. Six weeks later, she was out looking for her dog and spotted a horse lying on its side, unconscious. Two men in white, dressed like surgeons, were at work on the horse. There were two Air Force helicopters. Parked in the clearing, two men in Air Force uniforms, and the same two aliens who had helped her after her fall. The lady was spotted by the group and she was overtaken by a helicopter which flashed a blue light on her which burned her clothing. Help arrived as the helicopter retreated, and she was brought to the local hospital. People having nothing to do with the hospital staff began turning up to question her. After release she was harassed at all hours by strangers who insisted on questioning her, repeating the same questions over and over again. The couple moved to a different state, only to have it start all over again. MUFON began investigating this case, but as of 1986 had not yet made public its conclusions. Research into the case began in 1980. P-171, tissue samples taken from a carcass revealed the presence of chlorpromazine, a tranquilizer, P-171 comment by Gabe Valdez, whoever is doing these mutilations are highly organized and have a lot of resources. P-172, the theory of biogeochemical basis for the mutilations fails to account for the fact that mutilations are worldwide. P-174, when FBI agent Rommel was given $50,000 to investigate the mutilations in one district in New Mexico, all mutilations in that district stopped during the year. P-177, the Condon Report, Rommel Report, and the Warren Report all have a resemblance. P-177, the human tendency to avoid facing unpleasant facts may allow parasitic entities to farm us. P-178, 
a seven-year-old heifer was found whose unborn calf had been removed with breaking the placental bag. P-181, U.S. Senate lied to by Pentagon in 1968 during Senate hearings on UFOs. P-200, in an anonymous letter to a Denver paper on April 8, 1983, it was told that the mutilations are being done by a secret government group called Delta. Animal parts are used to test effects of germ warfare and poison, cyanide and dioxin, they are testing on civilians in America. Testing is associated with black helicopters. Helicopters are also used to ferry heroin and cocaine. Delta base is said to be all underground on Indian reservations. HQ for operations and where a lot of choppers are based in 28 miles east of Albuquerque on I-40, then 14 miles north on a dirt road into the Laguna Indian Reservation. Comment, disinformation attempt? P204, UPI story, February 2, 1984. Dr. James Womack at Texas on University announced his discovery that humans share perfect match chromosomes with cattle. The perfect match is with portions of the 21st chromosome pair, a strand known to carry characteristics of Mongolism or Down syndrome, associated with mental retardation. Dr. Womack says, we must have more in common than previously believed. P205, 1984 letter, a recent arrival on the nutritional scene is protomorphogens, or glandulars, ground up glands of cattle. If one takes these for a year you get hooked on them. Your own glands stop producing hormones. Many ebays have no alimentary canals and no glands. In some cancer clinics, these glandulars are used to treat cancer victims, and so are glands from human fetuses. P206, what is happening with the mutilations would make sense in human terms if the location on which the cattle grazed was important or the parts taken could be used geobiologically, which they aren't. P-208, UFOs are, extraterrestrial, ultraterrestrial, interdimensional, and time travelers. P-208, some UFOs behave as if the UFO itself was a living organism. Comment, refer to Trevor James Constable's book Sky Creatures, for a discussion of biological aeroforms, of flying saucers at Edibai Ra, by Wendell Stevens for a discussion of just that subject. P208, entities with cyborg-like traits, having both mechanical and biological features, turn up quite frequently in reports. P208, it is odd that among the viruses there are some that look like UFOs, like T bacteriophage. Do some UFO have the ability to operate in the micro-dimension of viruses? Comment. In the discipline of yoga is noted the ability to become large or small. P209, anyone with more access to even one more dimension than we have access to could evade our most carefully planned investigations indefinitely. P210, modern brain capacity, 1300 cc. Cro-Magnon man, 1400 cc. Bascop man, Migroid, sick, race, 1800 cc. The last two appeared quite suddenly. P210, Theory of Max H. Flynn attributes paradoxically rapid development of the human brain to interbreeding between primitive humanity and ETs. According to Flint, schizophrenia is caused by subconscious racial memory of the ET branch of the family tree, longing for home. Considerable differences between glandular and nervous systems between primitive humans and ETs would provide a basis for traumatic tension associated with regressed memory. P210 our civilization has forgotten the existence of other intelligent beings in the universe. P211, the idea that Homo sapiens is unique is becoming no longer tenable. Well, as if this weren't enough, let's examine the basic allegations that were raised by Gary Stolman when he held an empty BB gun to David Horowitz on KNBC Channel 4, Los Angeles, in October, 1987. Gary clearly though that he was alone in his knowledge, and evidently turned to desperation to have the public become aware of what he knew. For the sake of brevity, I will simply summarize the allegations, and make comments where I wish to do so. His physical father is in fact a clone created by the CIA and alien forces. Cloning is a part of a plot to overthrow the US government. The CIA maintains mental retraining hospitals. Phones were turned off at the hospital in Cincinnati for 48 hours after his arrival. A former CIA official had an interview on KPFK radio in which he told a college audience that the CIA has towed barges across New York Harbor that were disease-ridden. 
the CIA may have created the AIDS virus to wipe out the gay population. Comment, hmm, where have we heard that before? The CIA assassinated John F. Kennedy and the 22 material witnesses who died with two years. Comment, hmm, I have heard that as well. He demands that the Air Force release all information on UFOs. He demands that the information about Hangar 18 at Wright-Patterson, AFB, be released. He relates that he spoke to a girl at Florida Junior College who told him that seven of her friends had been replaced. The CIA doesn't trust people on computers. Individuals at the Optimist Boys School in Pasadena were recruited by others and given false IDs and birth certificates. There is a secret group led by the president's own staff. There are beings around with the power to teleport instantly and do the same to others, who can read and control minds, and transform matter into other forms and create it at will. He asks for a congressional investigation and federal protection. He states that he cannot harm anyone with an empty BB gun. Well, what do you think? Name deleted in original, replaced with the word MUFON, contacted Mr. Stolman's lawyer in December, 1987, and told him that some of what Gary had said may be true. His lawyer promptly made himself scarce. For some of you who keep an eye on the news, the president, Reagan, has said some mighty interesting things in some speeches of his. To the students of Falston High School in Falston, Maryland, on December 4, 1985, he said. I couldn't but, one point in our discussions with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings on this earth together. Well, I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us. To the 42nd General Assembly of the United Nations, September 21, 1987. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bond. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? Comment, apparently Mr. Reagan doesn't realize that war is not alien to the aspirations of peace, it's always been here. Does Mr. Reagan know something that we know but the general public doesn't know about what is happening and what will happen within the next five years? General Types of Entities the greys are known to be of three types. Grey 1, 3.5 feet tall. Large head. Large slanted eyes. Worship technology and don't care about us. Type popularized in communion by Streber. Grey 2, same general appearance, although has a different finger arrangement and a slightly different face. More sophisticated than Grey 1. They possess a degree of common sense and are somewhat passive. It is not known if they require the secretions needed by Gray 1. Gray 3, same basic type. Lips thinner. Subservient to other two types. Other entities known to frequent this planet. Blonde slash Swede slash Nordics, known by any of these names. Similar to us. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Will not break law of non-interference to help us would only intervene if the Grey's activity would affect other parts of the universe. Interdimensional, entities that can assume a variety of shapes. Basically of a peaceful nature. Short humanoids, 1.5 to 2.5 feet tall, skin bluish in color. Seen quite frequently in Mexico near Chihuahua. Hairy dwarfs, 4 feet tall. Weigh about 35 pounds. Hairy. Neutral. Respect intelligent life. Very tall race, look like us but 7 to 8 feet tall. United with the Swedes. Nordic clones, appear similar to us but with grey tinge to their skin. These are drones created by the greys. Childlike mentality. Men in black, MIB, oriental or olive skinned. Eyes sensitive to light. Eyes have vertical pupils. 
very pale skin in some types. Do not conform easily to our social patterns. Usually wear black clothes, drive black cars, and wear sunglasses. In groups they all dress alike. Sometimes time disoriented. They cannot handle a psychological curveball or interruption to their plan. Often intimidate UFO witnesses and impersonate government officials. Equivalent of our CIA. From another galaxy. Although there are some 40 or more known types of aliens visiting our world at the present time, these are the most commonly seen types. Extractive information from, UFO contact from undersea, Sanchez slash Stevens. Section 1, Regression Session, Filiberto Cardenas, Subject, Event Date, January 3, 1979 UFO CE3 During the regression sessions the following information came forth. 1. Subject was taken to one of three pyramid bases. Two pyramid bases are under ocean, one on land. Subject was taken to base between Baron and Santiago of the coast of Chile. Other underwater base is in the Atlantic in an unspecified location. The base was entered through an underwater tunnel. The alien stated that they had been there 36 months at that time. 2. Aliens told the subject that there were six other individuals whom the aliens had contacted. 3. Subject stated that the aliens voiced that they were eventually going to make themselves known to the world. 4. Aliens stated that they control the Chinese, and they have provided the Chinese with a device that can paralyze cities and towns completely. 5. Aliens stated that the device will cause a change that is going to be something for which the world cannot wait. The Chinese are to provoke certain unspecified changes, and that in those changes, people who are negative will disappear. 6. Subject remember seeing, future, scenes of people running disoriented along roads, and that there is a disaster coming. 7. Details of underwater tunnel described as walls of firmed water, not rock. The ship evidently generated a force field which repelled the water around it. 8. Devices were supposedly installed in subject's head by aliens. Subsequent x-rays revealed nothing. Session 3. 1. First contact with these groups of aliens began 4,000 years ago. 2. It has been thousands of years since this group last descended to Earth. 3. If progress on Earth does not continue, Aliens will use more forceful demonstrations to get their point across that we must have peace and progress. 4. Subject was interrogated for 15 days after the events by U.S. Security and Intelligence Services. 5. Information from aliens had also to do with an atrocity and the plan certain forces on Earth had planned. 6. Subject was 7 years old when contact with aliens first occurred. 7. Aliens have ability to dematerialize their craft. 8. Aliens stated that we should beware of other alien groups who will present themselves in a good light but if they pursue bad objectives against us they could do two things. They could destroy this planet with the same arms that this planet has, or on the contrary, transport away all our arms in one operation, which would take no more than 20 minutes of our time. They can be visible or not, whatever they choose. 8. Treatise references 81 other crossbreeds from, negative, aliens who have performed duties on Earth. Half alien half earthling equals crossbreed. 9. Aliens spoke of great portions of land and whole cities will disappear. Mexico City and major cities in California. History and Operations, Operation Trojan Horse. The amusing little mystery of flying saucers slowly evolves into a complicated series of coincidences and paradoxes as we plunge deeper and deeper into the data, excluding nothing, and considering everything as objectively as possible. Our skies have been filled with Trojan horses throughout history, and like the original Trojan horse, they seem to conceal hostile intent. Several facts are now apparent. The objects have always chosen to operate in a clandestine manner, furtively choosing the hours of darkness for their enigmatic activities over thinly populated areas, where the possibility of being detected is slight. The hostility factor is further supported by the fact that the objects chose, most often, to appear in forms which we can readily accept and explain to our own satisfaction, ranging from dirigibles to meteors and conventional appearing airplanes. The objects of unusual configuration, 
undoubtedly constituting a deceptive minority of all the paraphysical objects flitting about in our atmosphere. In other words, flying saucers are not at all what we have hoped they were. They are a part of something else. John A. Keel called that something else Operation Trojan Horse. When one really digs into UFO literature, it readily becomes clear that the ultra-terrestrials deliberately conveyed whatever impression that would meet the available frame of reference for that time. Until 1848, the religious frame of reference was constantly used by the phenomenon. As man's technology improved many of our old beliefs were discarded and the phenomenon was obliged to update its manifestations and establish new frames of reference. No more objects were seen in 1947 than had been seen in 1847. We were simply seeing them in a new way. A new game was being played with us. A new game has emerged, the artifact or hardware game. The phenomenon has always obliged us by planting false evidence all over the landscape. UFO cultists trap themselves into a hopeless situation almost from the outset. The apparent purpose of most of the landings seems to have been to advance belief in the frame of reference, not to provide absolute proof that the frame of reference is authentic. Physical Evidence All kinds of junk have fallen out of the sky throughout recorded history. Ivan T. Sanderson has in his files extensive lists that go back to Roman times. Ridiculous things such as stone pillars and heavy metal wheels have come crashing out of the blue, and there are countless cases of ice blocks, some weighing hundreds of pounds, dropping all over this planet. The flying saucers have been spewing all kinds of trash all over the landscape. In nearly every instance, these materials always prove to be ordinary earthly substances like magnesium, aluminum, chromium, and even plain old tin. Each of these incidents give the skeptics new ammunition. Mysterious hollow spheres have also been dropping out of the sky all over the world. Three such spheres were found in the Australian desert in 1963. They were about 14 inches in diameter and had a shiny polished surface. Efforts to open the spheres failed, and they were turned over to the USAF. Other metal spheres have dropped out of the sky in Mexico, 1967, and Conway, Arkansas, 1967. The Mexican steel ball was identified as titanium, the one in Arkansas steel. Smaller colored spheres were found scattered over the French countryside in 1966-67, as if it had been raining balls there. Where is all this stuff coming from? The same place as the stone pillars and blocks of ice. Innumerable cases of contact and landings have been flushed down the ufological drain because of the deliberate negative factors. Sincere witnesses have actually been ruined because the amateur UFO investigators have accused them of being liars and worse. Another fascinating game which the UFO knots play with a vengeance is the repair gambit. Beginning in 1897, there has been an endless stream of stories and reports, many from reliable witnesses, on how they encountered a grounded UFO and observed the occupants making repairs of some kind. The basic details in all these stories are so similar that it seems as if the UFO knots are following a carefully rehearsed procedure. Generally speaking, there are three, three, types of beings observed in relation to UFOs. Normal-looking people, including females. Oriental, dark-skinned beings. Unidentifiable creatures, who have made a real effort to hide from witnesses. Oddly enough, when all the reports and the data is in, the scope of the phenomenon and the overwhelming quantity of reports negates its validity. An analysis of cases indicates that flying saucers are not, in most cases, stable machines requiring fuel, maintenance, and logistical support. Most of them are, in all probability, transmutations of energy from other dimensions and do not exist in the same way that this paper exists. The UFO phenomenon seems to be largely subjective, that is, Specific kinds of people become involved and are actually manipulated by the phenomenon in the same way that it manipulates matter. These subjective experiences are far more important to our study than the random superficial sightings. We are obliged to forget about the sightings and concentrate on the claims and experiences of the contactees. Thousands of UFO photos have been taken since 1882. There's just one problem. With very few exceptions, no two UFO photos are alike. The sightings forced two unacceptable answers upon us. All the witnesses were mistaken or lying. Some tremendous unknown civilization is exerting an all-out effort to manufacture thousands of different types of UFOs and is sending them all to our planet. 
the governments of the world overtly have maintained variations of the first proposal. UFO enthusiasts accept the second. There is a third proposal which merits some attention. Some hard objects definitely exist as temporary materializations from other dimensions. They leave indentations in the ground when they land. Witnesses have touched them and even been inside them. These hard objects may be decoys to cover the multitudinous activities of the soft objects. The soft objects hold one of the keys of the mystery. There are countless sightings of objects which changed size and shape in front of witnesses who often get the impression that it was alive, that it was not behaving like a mechanical object at all. There is no question at all that there are intelligences that can manipulate or materialize any kind of object into our dimension. Let's take a look, for a second, at the electromagnetic spectrum. As you know, our visual spectrum makes up a small portion of the whole. Look at what's involved with UFOs. Ultraviolet. Blue is the UFO entry field. Cyan. Green the UFO is visible. Yellow. Red. Magenta. Infrared is the UFO departure field. Heat. Radio. If you will relate this to cases that you are familiar with, as far as appearance, spectrum shift when in flight, etc., you will see the applicability of the above diagram. When UFOs stabilize in our dimension they radiate energy on all frequencies and become glowing white. Radical maneuvers require a frequency alteration, which produces color changes. It is interesting to note that in Blue Book Report No. 14, they replace the phrase electromagnetic phenomenon with the word unknown in a majority of those cases. Why? There is no doubt that again, a situation exists where we have multiple realities within the UFO realm as well. It is clear that we are not dealing with random ET. Visitors. It has an extreme element of intention to do with all of it. Mutilation started in April, 1897, with the abduction of Alexander Hamilton's calf, witnessed by several people. That is one of the constants that has been with us that has not changed frame of reference. How many people give thought to the three dark-skinned wise men who appeared before the birth of Jesus, spread the reality of the happening, and disappeared again? All the dark-skinned men in threes. M.I.B. It makes you wonder. Hmm. Charting the enigma. Well, here we are again. Taking a sample of 33% of 10,000 or so cases, or about 3,330 cases, we find that 730 are so-called Type I, a low-level object observed and reported by reliable witnesses. It was found that 2,600 were Type II, high-altitude objects performing in a controlled manner and distinct from normal aircraft and natural phenomena. The time of the sightings depends on where you are. If you are in a rural area, sightings conveniently begin after 10 p.m. A populated area would have them between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. for some reason, in many flaps. Wednesday had about 20.5% of the sightings. Now, if the UFO phenomenon, and I dislike that word, had a purely psychic basis then I would think there would be more sightings on a Saturday, when people are statistically out and about than on Wednesday. There are notable exceptions to everything of course, one of which was the flap of August 16, 1966, which was on a Tuesday. Reports seem to cluster within political boundaries of states, as if there were a methodical exploration of states from border to border. If the UFO were a natural occurrence, one would expect otherwise. Thousands of sightings can be fitted into the Great Circle route, and often the dates are staggered so that it appears that the phenomenon moves systematically from point to point. Every state in the United States has from 2 to 10 windows. These are areas where UFOs appear repeatedly year after year. The objects will appear in these places and pursue courses confined to sectors with a radius of about 200 miles. The Great Circle from Canada, not to be confused with the traditional Great Circle, in the northwest through the central states and back into northeast Canada is a major window. Hundreds of smaller windows lie within that circle. Another major window is centered in the Gulf of Mexico and encompasses much of Mexico, Texas and the Southwest. As mentioned previously, many windows center directly over area of magnetic deviation. UFOs seem to congregate about the highest available hills in these window areas. They become visible in these centers and then radiate outward, traveling sometimes 100 to 200 miles before disappearing again. 
Among the great heaps of neglected and ignored UFO data, we find hundreds of many people accounts. These are very rarely published anywhere because they tend to be so unbelievable. Most of them are identical to the fairy and gnome stories of yesteryear. Witnesses to these events can experience conjunctivitis, akinesia, paralysis, amnesia, and the other effects often noted by witnesses to more conventional events. One notable event is one that occurred in Seattle, Washington, in the latter part of August, 1965. A woman awoke around 2 a.m. and discovered she could not move a muscle or make a sound. Her window was open, and suddenly a tiny, football-sized dull gray object floated through the window and hovered over the carpet near her bed. Three legs lowered from the object and it settled to the floor. A small ramp extended from it and five or six tiny people clambered out and seemed to work on some kind of repairs on the object. They wore tight-fitting clothing. When they were finished, they got in and the object took off and sailed out the window. At that point, she was able to move. The case was investigated by J. Russell Jenkins of Seattle. You can readily see why almost none of these kinds of stories ever appear in print, except in occult-oriented literature. Nevertheless, if we hope to assess the true UFO situation, we must examine all these stories. We can learn nothing by considering only those incidents which are emotionally and intellectually acceptable to us. Time is one of the most important aspects of the UFO thing. It plays a strange but significant role. Part of the answer may not lie in the stars but in the clock ticking on your fireplace. Our world exists in three dimensions. We can move in many directions within these dimensions. Space does not exist except when we make it exist. To us, the distance between atoms and our matter is so minute that it can only be calculated with hypothetical measurements. Yet, if we lived on an atom, and our size was relative to its size, the distance to the next atom would seem awesome. There is another man-made measurement called time. Unlike the other three dimensions, time has us seemingly trapped. Time becomes very real to us, and it appears that we couldn't live without it. Yet, time doesn't really exist at all. This moment exists to us. Does this mean the same moment is being shared by other planets? The UFO phenomenon does seem to be controlled. It does follow intelligent patterns. If the objects themselves are manifestations of higher energies, then something has to manipulate those energies somehow and reduce them to the visible frequencies. Not only do they enter the visible frequencies, but they take forms which seem physical and real to us, and they carry out actions which seem to be intelligent. Thus we arrive at the source. The source has to be a form of intelligent energy operating at the highest possible point of the frequency spectrum. If such an energy exists at all, it might permeate the universe and maintain equal control of each component part. Because of its very high frequency, so high that the energy particles are virtually standing still, the source has no need to replenish itself in any way that would be acceptable to our environmental sciences. It could actually create and destroy matter by manipulating the lower energies. It would be timeless, because it exists beyond all time fields. It would be infinite because it is not confined by three-dimensional space. Children. Children figure neatly into this, and they always have. The child's mind, especially before the so-called age of reason when the logic circuits begin to form, is a clear instrument, open and uninfluenced by opinions and conclusions. This is an important point in the UFO mystery. Perhaps, if we were in a pure energy state, each particle of energy would itself serve as a synapse, and information could be stored by a slight alteration in frequency. All the memory fragments of a rose, for example, would be recorded at one frequency, and, the whole energy form could tune into that memory by adjusting frequencies, as we might adjust a radio receiver. In other words, no complex circuitry would be required. No body would be necessary. The energy patterns would not need material form. It would permeate the entire universe. It could surround you completely at this very moment and be aware of all the feeble impulses of low energy passing through your brain. If it's so desired, it could control those pulses and thus control your thoughts. Man has always been aware of this intelligent energy or force. He has always worshipped it. Our first conclusion is that the UFOs originate from beyond our own time frame or time cycle. Our second conclusion is that the source has total foreknowledge of human events and even of individual lives. Since time and space are not absolutes, 
these two conclusions are compatible. It is that all human events occur simultaneously when viewed by a greater intelligence. If a greater intelligence wants to communicate with a lower form, all kinds of problems are presented. The communication must be conducted in a manner which will be meaningful and understandable to the lower life form. An acceptable frame of reference must be found and utilized. UFO phenomenon, especially the soft ones, are frequently reflective, that is, the observed manifestations seem to be deliberately tailored and adjusted to the individual beliefs and attitudes of the witnesses. Contactees are given information which, in most cases, conforms to their beliefs. UFO researchers who concentrate on one particular aspect or theory find themselves inundated with seemingly reliable reports which seem to substantiate that theory. John Keel's extensive experiences with this reflective factor led him to carry out weird experiments which confirm that a large part of the reported data is engineered and deliberately false. The witnesses are not the perpetrators, but, merely the victims. The apparent purpose of all this false data is multifold. Much of it is meant to create confusion and diversion. Some of it has served to support certain beliefs which were erroneous but, which would serve as stepping stones to the higher, more complex truth. Whole generations have come and gone, happily believing in the false data, unaware that they were mere links in the chain. If it were all understood too soon, we might crumble under the weight of the truth. This earth is covered with windows into those other unseen worlds. If we had the instruments to detect them, we would find that these windows are the focal points for super high frequency waves, the rays of ancient lore. These rays might come from Orion or the Pleiades as the ancients claimed or they might be part of the great force that emanates throughout the universe. The UFOs have given us the evidence that such rays exist. Now, slowly, we are being told why. It is also apparent that some entities are having a good laugh at our expense. As mentioned before, literature indicates that the phenomenon carefully cultivated the religious frame of reference in early times, just as the modern manifestations have carefully supported the extraterrestrial frame of reference. The devil's emissaries of yesteryear have been replaced by the mysterious man in black. A major, but little explored, aspect of the UFO phenomenon is therefore theological and philosophical rather than purely scientific. The UFO problem can never be untangled by physicists and scientists unless they are. Men who also are schooled in the other disciplines. The earth was occupied before man arrived or was created. That's an important point to consider. The original occupants were paraphysical and possessed the power of transmutation of matter. Man was the interloper. The inevitable conflict arose between physical man and the paraphysical owners of the planet. Man accepted the interpretation that this conflict raged between his creator and the devil. The religious viewpoint has always been that the devil has been attacking man, trying to get rid of him, by causing havoc upon him. There is historical and modern proof that this may be so. It is interesting that parapsychologists have long concluded that the paralysis that contactees experience is a contributing cause, that the entity may materialize by utilizing energy from the percipient himself. John Keel has in his files hundreds of cases, some of which have now been investigated by qualified psychiatrists, in which young men and women obsessed with the UFO phenomenon have suffered. Frightening visits from apparitions, followed up by mysterious black Cadillacs which appeared and disappeared suddenly, and have been terrified into up their pursuit of the UFOs. The phenomenon is again reflective in nature, the more frightened the victim becomes, the more the manifestations are escalated. Think about it. The other side of the coin. There is a balance in nature, and there also seems to be a balance in the UFO picture. People have actually died after exposure to the gamma and UV rays from UFOs. But, other people have actually had their ailments cured by similar rays. Occult literature is filled with accounts of this type. Except for those who might be specially constructed for incubus-succubus activities, it does appear that our angels and spacemen come from a world, in many cases, with sex, and very probably, a world without an organized society, a world in which each individual is merely a unit in the whole and is totally controlled by the collective intelligence or energy mass of that whole. In other words, these beings, or some of them anyway, have no free will. They are slaves of a very high order. Often they try to convey this to percipients with their statements, we are one, we are in bondage. 
we face a great task in trying to isolate the UFO phenomenon from the larger and more important big picture, the overall situation of which the UFOs are merely a small part. Elemental beings are another aspect of the world we live in. Children see them more than adults, perhaps for the reasons described before. Historical records certainly indicate that the little people have always existed all over this planet, that they possess the power of flight, the power of invisibility, and, to varying degrees, the power to dominate and control the human mind. Accounts of little humanoids with supernatural powers can be found in almost every culture. The manifestations have remained the same throughout history. Only our interpretations of those events have changed. It brought the birth of spiritualism, which was in its heyday in the 1850s and 1860s, and was just another form of communication between the ultra-terrestrials and ourselves. UFO flaps also parallel outbreaks of poltergeist cases. It all ties in together. Assuming that each discovered historical report represents a larger number of unpublished or undiscovered reports, just as today's UFO reports represent on the average 250 unreported or unpublished sightings, we can conclude that a flap condition existed, for example, in the years 1820, 1834, 1844, 1846, and 1849. We also find that there was an outbreak of poltergeists in 1835, 1846, and 1849. As the 19th century progressed, reporting improved, and we are able to make more precise correlations. A UFO flap took place in 1850, and there was also a series of poltergeist cases. A larger poltergeist outbreak occurred in 1867, following flaps in 1863-64. UFO activity became more intense beginning in 1870, and there were notable flaps in 1872, 1877, and 1879. The 1880s produced a major explosion of all kinds of phenomena, including the sudden disappearance of people. Poltergeist cases were in abundance in that decade, particularly in the big flap years of 1883 and 1885. Astrophysicist Morris K. Jessup labeled the years 1877-87 the incredible decade after scouring astronomical journals of the period. Astronomers made some remarkable discoveries during those years. The previously unobserved satellites of Mars popped into view in 1877, new craters appeared on the Moon, all kinds of strange objects flitted around the upper atmosphere. The trance phenomenon deserves extensive study because so many aspects of it are directly related to the contactee phenomenon. In both, you will find the same contradictions. There seem to be both good and evil forces at work. The good guys latch on to people with particularly receptive minds and turn them into trance mediums and the bad guys use the same methods to tamper with the minds of contactees and even to commit murder indirectly. Since incidents of these types can be traced throughout history, it seems probably that these forces have always been here on this planet. Do the ultraterrestrials really care about us? There is much evidence to suggest that they don't. They care only to the extent that we can fulfill our enigmatic use to them. There have been innumerable psychic hoaxes for the past 150 years, and many of these parallel the UFO hoaxes. In ufology we have to contend with the teenager's hot air balloon, and in psychic phenomenon we have to worry about youngsters firing rocks at houses. There are, however, more UFO sightings than there are plastic balloons, and more poltergeists dumping rocks in living rooms than there are wild-eyed youngsters with slingshots. There are also more ultra-terrestrial entities than either the occultists or the UFO researchers can dream of. Giant winged beings, usually described as headless, are an integral part of the UFO phenomenon. Winged human forms have been seen flying over many areas of the world. John A. Keel wrote a book called The Mothman Prophecies and Gray Barker a book called The Silver Bridge that go into some detail. They are usually described as having blazing red eyes set deep in their shoulders. On May 13, 1917, three girls in Portugal were in the meadows of a place called Cova de Iria outside of Fatima, Portugal, when they saw a flash of light in the clear sky. They ran for shelter under a tree, thinking that was lightning. When they reached the tree, they stopped in amazement, for there hovering just above a three-foot evergreen nearby, a brilliant globe of light hung suspended. Within this globe there was an entity garbed in a luminous white robe with a face of light which dazzled and hurt the eyes. The figure stated that it was from heaven, and asked the girls to come there on the 13th day, for six months in succession. On October 13, 1917, 
an estimated 70,000 people had gathered at the site. Suddenly the crowd screamed, for something came through the clouds, a huge silver disc which rotated rapidly as it descended towards the crowd. It seemed to change color, going through the spectrum. These gyrations continued for 10 minutes. Miles from there, others were also watching the same object. The incident at Fatima was obviously a carefully planned and deliberately executed demonstration. The major prophecies of Fatima had been written down and sealed in an envelope, and turned over to the Vatican. They were supposed to be revealed to the world in 1960. The secret of Fatima? One pope was murdered after only 30 days in office when the Vatican thought he would reveal it. It is said to be a prediction of the end of the world. The demonstration was therefore a failure as far as the ultra-terrestrials were concerned. Such demos proved highly effective in biblical times, but, times were changing and new methods were called for. A similar event such as Fatima took place in Garbendal, Germany, on July 2, 1961. Even more startling, on the entity's right side they could see a square of red fire framing a triangle with an eye and some writing. The lettering was in an old oriental script. The third eye. Haven't we heard of that before? Remember the nation of the third eye, the MIB etc.? Addendum by the author. Gravitational propulsion. Well, I have gotten this far in explaining some things to you. I might as well turn to my favorite subject of all, gravitational propulsion. The best place to start is with the efforts of a personal acquaintance of mine who had the good fortune to meet in England, Mr. J. R. Searle. His investigations into gravitational propulsion have proven to be quite revealing, he's done it, and I want to tell you about it. In 1949, he was employed by the Midlands Board as an electronic fitter. He was very enthusiastic about the subject of electricity, though he had no formal education on the subject other than was required by his job. Unhindered by conventional ideas about electricity, he carried out his own investigation into the subject. During work on electrical motors and generators, he noticed that a small electromotive force, EMF, was produced by the spinning metal parts, the negative toward the outside and the positive toward the rotational axis. In 1950, he experimented with rotating slip rings and measured a small EMF on a conventional meter. He also noticed that when the rings were spinning freely and no electrical current was taken, his hair bristled. His conclusions were that free electrons in the metal were spun out by centrifugal force being produced by the static field in the metal. He then decided to build a generator on the same principle. It had a segmented rotor disc, passing through electromagnets at its periphery. The electromagnets were energized from the rotor, and were intended to boost the EMF. By 1952, the first generator had been constructed and was about 3 feet in diameter. It was tested in the open by Searle and a friend. The armature was set in motion by a small engine. The device produced the expected electrical power, but, at an unexpectedly high potential. At relatively low armature speeds a potential of the order of 10 to the power of 5 volts was produced, as indicated by static effects on nearby objects. The really unexpected then occurred. While still speeding up, the generator lifted and rose to a height of about 50 feet above the ground, breaking the union between itself and the engine. Here it stayed for a while, still speeding up and surrounding itself with a pink glow. This indicated ionization of air at a much reduced pressure of about 10 to the power of minus 3 mhg. More interesting was the side effect, causing local radio receivers to go on by themselves. Finally, the whole generator accelerated at a fantastic rate and is thought to have gone off into space. Since that day, Searle and others have made some 10 or more small flying craft, some of which have been similarly lost, and have developed a form of control. Larger craft have been built, some 12 feet and 230 feet in diameter. Once the machine has passed a certain threshold of potential voltage, the energy output exceeds the input. The energy output seems to be virtually limitless. We made some measurements when I was there, and as far as we could see, the estimated output is somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to the power of 13 to 10 to the power of 15 watts. Above what appears to be the threshold potential, some 10 to the power of 13 volts, the generator and attached parts become inertia-free. There is also some matter snatch upon acceleration away from the ground, since it tends to take a little turf with it when it goes. 
analyzing what is happening is fairly easy. What the generator is doing is placing a stress on the ambient space around it. The space breaks down to provide the magnetism to relieve the stress, but the energy byproduct is absorbed by the generator, which reinforces the field. It should be noted at this point that only a very small amount of space fabric passes through the craft and an even smaller amount is converted for energy. However, I have noticed that small changes in etheric forces lead to large physical effects. It was aptly demonstrated and I was impressed. Recently, Mr. Searle had, 1987, a brush with authorities, when he began simply generating his own power for his own house. Now he doesn't have a very large house, but, the utility board didn't like. The fact that they had lost their monopoly. Now, he lives in Birmingham under an assumed name. Simple, eh? End of file.